Matthew chapter 25. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like this. Ten virgins took their lamps and went to the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, five were wise. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no extra oil with them. But the wise took their flasks with oil for their lamps. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at the midnight hour, there was a cry. Here comes the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose, trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil, our lamps are going out. But the wise answered saying, since there's not enough for us and you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came and those who were ready went with them to the marriage feast and the door was shut. Afterward, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, truly, I tell you, I do not know you. Then Jesus says, watch, therefore, you do not know the day or the hour. I wasn't going to preach this, but I, the other day I was praying and the Lord said, no, you preach this. So many of us have heard this scripture before, specifically dealing with the return of Christ. Am I right? Right? The Lord showed me and revealed something to me that is for now. If you've ever heard someone say they have a prophetic word, listen, I grew up in a church where it was, the the prophetic was not used much. So I've had to learn this over the last couple of years. This, I believe, is a prophetic word for for the church for now, what I'm about to share with you, okay? So I'm gonna dive into this. There's five, oh man, I'm excited. There's five who the Bible says are foolish and five who are wise. There's one distinguishing factor on whether or not they're foolish or whether or not they're wise. It's whether or not they had extra oil. So Jesus is saying, if you're foolish or if you're wise, the distinguishing factor is if you have extra oil. All throughout the Bible, oil represents the Holy Spirit. Some of you see where I'm going now. I'll paint this picture for you. Jesus says this. Luke chapter 8. Excuse me, Luke chapter 4, verse 8. He's in the synagogue, and he's quoting Isaiah 61. And he says this. The Lord has anointed me to preach the good news. There was an anointing that happened. The oil of the Lord was on him. The Holy Spirit was on him. In John, we see the scripture says that when he was baptized, when he came up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord descended on him like a dove and stayed there. Did not leave. You notice that it says they all fell asleep. The foolish and the wise both. They all fell asleep. When, they did, when the bridegroom didn't come, when they thought, they all fell asleep. Curl your toes under. I might step on them. How many times have we heard as a church, Jesus is coming back? And we've heard it so much that it becomes numb and we fall asleep to it. And in this hour, I believe there's a prophetic cry of ministry rising up all over the world where God's saying, wake up, I'm coming. And there is a, there is a people, there is a church, there is a body of believers that have heard the cry and they're saying, he's coming back. Wake up before it's too late. Wake up and get your oil. Wake up. Revival is coming. Awakening is here. Wake up. You can't be sleeping on God anymore. The church cannot be asleep any longer. You see, there's a timeline here. They fall asleep. There's a cry. Then it says they went out and encountered the king. It's moments like this in this setting that God 
has set up and ordained for us to encounter him before he comes and takes us away. Because you see, if we never have encounter, this, my friends, is simply a history book. If you haven't encountered the one this book is talking about, you're missing a lot of it. I can memorize this all I want. I can study it all I want. But if I'm not in relationship with the one it's talking about, I'm missing something. How can I be in relationship with someone if I've never been with them? And, and there's, in this hour, I believe God is saying, wake up and encounter me. I want to take you somewhere you've never been before so you can do things you've never done before. Sure. See, they were unable to share the oil. They had to go and pay the price themselves. There's, there's one thing I know. Look, you ever heard the term being on fire for God? Anybody ever heard the term being on fire for God? It's biblical. It's not just a charismatic Pentecostal thing. It's biblical. If they wanted light in those days, they set a fire. They set the lamp on fire. There was no electricity switch. There had to be a fire. And Jesus says, let your light, a.k.a. your fire, be set up on a lampstand so that everyone around may see it. It's time for us to let our fire burn again. But guess what? The fuel for the fire is the oil. The fuel to burn for Jesus is the oil of the Holy Spirit. And what we've done is we put the Holy Spirit on the side, on the back burner and said, no, we don't want to speak in tongues. No, we don't need the prophetic. No, we don't need the gifts of God. And God is saying, no, I'm raising up a company of believers who will let me be me and let me show up and show off and let the Holy Spirit do the work he's called us to do. Listen, can I tell you something? Administration is not a spiritual gift. Prophecy is. Excel spreadsheet it's not a spiritual gift. Miracles are. Faith is. Signs and wonders are. I think that's definitely needed. I'm not saying that if you have the gift of administration, you're not important to the body. But what I am saying, according to Scripture, is that the Holy Spirit doesn't give that gift. The Spirit of the Lord gives us things that will help us grow the kingdom. Can I tell you something? When we went over to Africa... It wasn't me preaching about leadership. It was me preaching Jesus Christ crucified with a demonstration of power that had the unbelievers believing and the ones who were demonized rolling on the ground being set free. It was Jesus Christ and him alone. I didn't have to preach 12 different point message. I preached Jesus. Why? Because Jesus always backs up his word. Because he is the word made flesh. I'm going to get off on a tangent if I'm not careful. All right, so they wake up, and it says they trimmed their wicks. Now, we read over this a lot of times with significance here. Why did they trim their wicks? Because once a wick is burnt, it's extremely hard to get it to burn again. And if it does, it burns smoky and dirty. And what that means is that a lot of us, we've already had one encounter, and we're trying to live off that last encounter. And God said, no, you need to trim off the old, trim off the past, and you need a fresh encounter with me. So you can burn bright for me, so you can burn the way I've called you to burn and be the fire I've called you to burn so you can shine for me the way I've called you to shine. Listen, we cannot sit here and say, my encounter from 20 years ago that's old and smoky and dusty and dirty is going to get me to where I need to be in the kingdom so more people can see him. I don't want people seeing smoke and dirt. I want them seeing the fire of God in me. Trim the wick. Trim the wick. Let the old be the old. Reminisce, but step into the newness of God and say, God, what do you have for me now? What do you have for me now? I grew up in the church and I thought, God, there has to be more. And one day I was sitting in my house by myself, sitting down the hallway on my knees. And I said, God, if there's more, I need it. And before I knew it, I was snotting and slobbering and speaking in some language I didn't know. At the time, my wife was hanging out with a friend. I think her name 
him was Melissa. And she had went off to prayer meeting. And of course, that made me feel even more convicted because I was just at the house. So I'm sitting in the hallway, snotting and slobbering, and what I now know is praying in the Spirit, speaking in tongues, heavily language to the Father. I hear the door open. And right past me was the bathroom, and I, I feel someone brush past me, and I guess go in the bathroom. Next thing I know, Vanessa comes in, she lays her hands on me, and she said, is this what I think it is? And I said, I don't know, I guess. I just want something real. I can't live off my parents' stories and encounters. I can't live off what the pastor says. I need it for me. I need Jesus for me. So we got to talk and we prayed some more. And I said, hey, where's Melissa? She said, huh? I said, where's Melissa? She said, she's not here. the Lord that was there <laughs> listen the Bible says that they couldn't share the oil they had to pay for it themselves and this is where I believe the western culture of church gets in trouble we want to be spoon-fed the message. We want to flip on TV and get a word from the Lord. We want a rotisserie style here. It's, or we want that quick microwave style here, here, here. And, you know, God's a rotisserie God. Why? Because it tastes better, right? And so he, it takes time. We have to put in the price. And what I've experienced in my life and what I believe Scripture reveals is that there's really two ways that we pay the price to get the oil, Right? Here it is. One is, we cannot be afraid of the crushing. How do they get the oil out of the olive? They crush it. You see, and a lot of us are over here saying, God, get me out of this. Get me out of this. Is God saying, I have to crush you so you can be who I've called you to be and be the anointed one I've called you to be anointed. I, you'll not have the anointing if you don't let me crush you. Don't pray to get out of it. Let me take you through it. Let me crush you. Because if you're not crushed, you won't be powerful. You won't hear my voice like you should. I've been in that crushing place so I can speak from experience. It ain't fun, but on the other side, you'll see God do things he's never done through you before. You'll hear his voice like you've never heard him before. The second way, outside of the crushing, in the Old Testament, what happened is that when a woman would be prepared to be with the king, it would take about a year, up to two years, they would prepare her to meet with the king. And she would be bathed in fine oils and spices and fragrances for over a year for one night with the king. And see, what happens is that God calls us, like Vanessa was saying, into this secret place where he says, let me pour out the oil of intimacy on you. Because here's the thing. How can you represent or represent one that you've never spent time with? And God's saying, listen, come into this place with me. Just be with me. Just a little closer. Five more minutes. Can I speak to you one-on-one? -on -one? I've got secrets I want to tell you. Please, please, let me pour out the oil on your life that you need. The oil of intimacy that will allow you to burn for me like I've called you to burn for me. See, the importance of intimacy is that nothing of significance is birthed without intimacy. There must be intimacy if something significant is going to happen in your life. My goodness, I'm up here crying. Whew. 
And see, here's the thing. Jesus is the perfect example. We see this in the scriptures, right? What did he say when he's in the Garden of Gethsemane? He said, if this is possible, take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. And as he's praying this, the Bible says he's sweating blood. There is such a, press, a pressing and, and a intense prayer that he's sweating blood. Watch this. Garden of Gethsemane translated in the original language means olive press. And what Jesus was saying is, I'm about to be crushed so my oil can be poured out on everyone who believes in me. I don't know who you are tonight, where you're from tonight, what you're going through tonight, but God has more for you. He's got his oil to pour out on you. Greater anointing, greater blessing, greater faith, greater favor. It's all accessible. Are we willing to get it? Are we willing to get it? Because I want to tell you something. You know why the Lord shared this with me to share with you tonight? Because he's ready for some of you to go deeper. He's ready for some of you to dive in head first. He's ready for some of you to say, you know what, God, it's okay if you press me because I know on the other side of this pressing, I'm going to see things I've never seen before and do things I've never done before for you. God, I will go into the secret place. I will get up at 4 or 5 a.m. and speak with you and talk with you and love on you. Because if I don't, I'm selling myself short for the kingdom. I don't want to be sold short. I want everything God has for me. God will use you in whatever situation you're in. I'm going to share a testimony with you. And then we're going to have some time of prayer and intercession. Is that cool? And uh, impartation. Many of you know we, we moved up to Tennessee this summer, which was totally a God thing. I'll have to share that later. But um, what I'll do is I go out and I drive Uber two, three, four nights a week, depending. And do you know, this is not the church. These, wa these walls are not the church. We are. The Spirit of the Lord dwells in me, dwells in you. So wherever you go, he goes. And when people get in the door and I drive them somewhere, guess what? Jesus just tends to show up. So I, I shared this with many of you. Many of you heard this particular story. But um, it was late one night. I was fixing to head back to the house, pick the guy up. He was like half drunk or whatever. And uh, anyways, long story short, <coughs> when he got in the car, I said, Lord, what do you want me to tell him? You see, sometimes we just need to be like Eli. Lord, I'm listening. You know, the Lord was trying to get Eli's attention, and finally he just... After instruction, he said, Lord, I'm listening. I think some of us need to just take a moment and say, Lord, I'm listening. Will you speak? So I, he gets in the car and said, Lord, what do, you want, what do you want me to tell him? And immediately the Lord told me what to say. But it was like a 20-minute drive, and I didn't want to, like, make it awkward the last 18 minutes. So I waited till we were about three minutes out from his house, and I said, listen, man. And um, the, the guy uh, called himself a homosexual. He was very open about that. Long story short, God knows the heart of man. He knows everything they go through. He knows what they need when they need it. He did not need me bash over the head with a Bible and say, you're going to hell. He needed to see Jesus. So I shared with him what I felt like the Lord was saying. It's quiet for the rest of the ride home. I was like, I knew that was going to happen. Pull up to the house and he's still sitting in my back seat. I'm like, oh man, what's going on? You know, you can get out now. And all of a sudden he says, like sniffling. Hey, can I have a hug? Right then I knew the Holy Spirit already hit him. I said, sure. So went outside the car, hugged him, and he collapsed in my arms. And he said, I got to get my life right. I said, let's do it. And so I asked him, I said, well, what, what's going on here? And he said, I don't know, but when you started speaking... I was no longer drunk. He said, and I felt like this warmth come over me in your car. And I said, that's Jesus. And he loves you. And he wants a relationship with you. How do you do that? Long story short, he got saved, filled with the spirit before he stepped in his house.
when we talk about activation, this is part of it. When you see opportunities, you take them. This is not just a Tim English thing or a pastor thing or a preacher thing. God speaks to all of us if we'll listen. This is why Jesus died on the cross, because the veil was torn so that we could enter in and spend time with the Father and get to know his ear or his voice so we could hear him. What does the Bible say? My sheep know my voice. Remember when Mary goes to see Jesus and he's not in the tomb and she sees the two angels sitting there on either end of the, of the tomb where he was laying. She turns around, she thinks it's a gardener, but it's actually Jesus and she's all, he says, what's wrong? And she says, have you taken Jesus? Where is he? Just give me him. And as soon as she says, Mary, she says, my Lord. You see, because she knew his voice. I wonder, do you know his voice well enough that if he said your name, you would know that's Jesus. I want you to bow your heads where you're at.